This is the new Hyundai Tucson, and it's a bit like a patchwork quilt. And I'll actually explain why a bit later in the video. I'll also show you around the inside, the outside, and take it for a drive. We'll find out if it's any good, and if it's a good alternative to cars such as the Volkswagen Tiguan and the Skoda Karak. Anyway, I'm Matt Watson, and you're watching CarWow. Buying a new car? Then head to CarWow, and my team will help you find your next car at a fair price. CarWow, your one-stop car buying comparison site. Let's kick off this video by talking about the price. So this new Hyundai Tucson starts from just over £28,000, rising to over £37,000 for this range-topping hybrid in ultimate, ultimate trim. trim. Thankfully, you can save an average of almost £3,000 off a new Tucson through CarWow. Now, if you want to check out the latest car deals, I put a little link popping out in the top right-hand corner of the screen. Click on that, you can go to our website, check those out. There is also a link below the video. Alternatively, if you just want to do that at a later date, simply Google Help Me Car Wow, and my team and I will help you choose the right car for you and get it for a fair price from one of our trusted dealers. Let's talk about the Tucson's design. And this is where the patchwork quilt bit comes in because this car is basically a hodgepodge of lots of different design elements from other makes and models. Okay, let's start with this light bar at the back. That's just like you get on the new Seat Leon. Then there's these light elements here, which are just like those on a Peugeot 3008. Then down here, this diamond effect, like you have on a Toyota CHR. Moving down the side, there's more Toyota action going on here, squared off wheel arches, like the new RAV4. These wheel designs remind me of those on my Audi RS6. This part is like on a Vauxhall or an Opel, depending on where you're from, Crossland. Moving to the front here, this crease over the front wheel arch, very strong, very bold, very much like that on a Bentley Flying Spur. Then at the front, the whole outline of this grille, the way it goes into the lights, is just like a Mercedes EQC. Then there's the actual look of the body, the way it arcs down. And in this colour, it doesn't look like a car, it actually reminds me of the Alien. And you know that horrible, like, extra mouth in the mouth, bitey bit? That's the Hyundai badge. Yeah, you can't even see that now, can you? I'm not so keen on the look of this car, actually. I don't think it, it's very cohesive. The old Tucson looked quite a bit better, if you ask me. Anyway, let's check out the inside, see if that's an improvement. Here on the inside, I do actually prefer this new Tucson. It feels posher than before. I actually really like the design of the dash, the sweeping effect, the way it wraps around you. The material quality is generally pretty good with squidgy materials about the place. The only thing is this centre console is a bit wobbly. But hey, that's the only complaint really. Ah, wait a minute, that looks familiar. The steering wheel looks like that on an Audi A8. That's the only copying though, the rest of it is a little bit more original. You've got this big centre console here where you've got your controls for your climate. Now they're not actual physical buttons, so you do have to feel your way around them, but it's easier than going through a touch screen. Speaking of the touch screen, widescreen as standard, you get this nice big display. So it looks a bit dull at first, but actually when you get into the different functions, it's quite clear. So look, I'll bring up the map now. You'll see it's quite bright and clear and good graphics. It's not the fastest responding screen, but it's more than adequate. And anyway, you're going to use your phone because it's got Apple CarPlay and Android Auto as standard. Then you've got your digital driver's display. You get that on all models yet again. Very clear. You can cycle through different menus. So you have things like your driver assist systems, all your driving data, your navigation, and some other bits and pieces. Nice and easy to use. The driving position itself is pretty decent. Lots of adjustment in the steering wheel. You can really jack up the seat very high to get a good view out. Obviously, that's what you want in an SUV such as this. Another thing you want is practicality. And it is fairly decent, so look, decent sized glove box, a big storage area here, and you actually have your wireless charging there for your mobile phone, but there's still plenty of room for lots of other bits and pieces. Two USB inputs there, and a 12 volt socket if you want to do it the old way. Though, speaking of the old way, I am surprised they don't have USB C sockets, they're the old ones. Now, there's a bit more storage just here where you can put some bits and pieces and you've got two cup holders there and they're a decent enough size. The door bins are all right as well, looking fit that in there. And underneath here, you've got quite a big bin for storing God, whatever you want to store in there, really. I don't know, you decide. Thing is though, while this interior is nice, it's just not as cool as a Peugeot 3008. And if you'd like to see my full in-depth video review of that car, put a little link, it should be popping out in the top right hand corner of the screen. If you click on that, you can go watch it. There's also a link in the description below. Anyway, let's check out the back seats. There's plenty of room here. Look at this, lots of knee room. Headroom's good, even with the glass roof fitted on this particular car. I mean, this car is the range-topping model, so it's got everything 
fitted to it. It's insane. It's even got like heated seats here in the back, which is really nice on a day like today where it's freezing. One thing I want to point out about this car is that this seat base is really, really deep, a little bit too deep for me. And as a result, you feel it pushing underneath your knees. So you end up sitting a bit like that. And because it extends so far, it means that there's not enough room for you to really stretch out under the seat in front. It's just a bit awkward. As a result, I don't think it's quite as comfy in the back as a Volkswagen Tiguan. Now, if you click on the pop-out banner up there, you can watch my full in-depth video review of the new Tiguan. I've also put a link below the video. What this does have over the Tiguan though is better quality in the back. They haven't cheaped out like Volkswagen have for the back passengers. And it's generally pretty decent. You can't slide the seats forward or backwards, but you can recline them and they do recline quite a bit. So it is generally very comfy back here. I'm gonna show you this as well, look. The rear windows. Oh yeah, they go all the way down. This car's got the blind option as well. There we are, like that. Also like this, look. You got some cup holders in there, but because of the location of them, you don't end up putting your elbow in them if they were lengthways like they are on some other cars. So that's fine, that is. This is also fine. Look, I said it was fine. <laughs> Not so fine now, because the release is quite tight, but you can fold down this middle seat for some through loading. Alternatively, you can put an extra passenger here, look. And it is all right. The body's just about wide enough to cope with three adults in the back. And it helps that this floor is almost completely flat. So there is just about enough room for everybody's feet back here. Some other things to note, we have elasticated pockets on the seat backs. This car has actual climate control in the back for this particular model and two USB ports there for charging your mobile devices. Though once again, they are the old style of USB connection. Finally, door bins in the back are just about adequate. Now let's check out the boot because this is a strong point for this car. So the capacity is 620 litres. Now it falls to 577 litres if you have the hybrid, but it's still bigger, like for like, to its competitors. And look, it's a big square shape. As a result, you can fit in seven airplane size carry-on luggage cases. And look, there's no load lip, so you can just slide them in and out nice and easily. Underneath here, you have some more storage. Yeah, that's good. And if you want to fold down the rear seats, you don't have to walk around to the side. There are handy levers here. Oh, that just drops down nice and easy. It's not completely flat, that floor, but it's continuous, so you can, once you push that down, slide things to the front like that. You've got a 12 volt socket there. Oh, that's handy. And there's a couple of tie down points. They really, they do feel very flimsy. I'm not sure how much they're going to tie down. And that brings me on to five annoying things about this car. I'm not a big fan of when manufacturers hang the middle rear seat belt from the roof because once you lock it into place like this, you shall see that it does ever so slightly get in the way of the passenger on the right. Hmm. I prefer it when they just have it integrated into the central seat itself. This hybrid version of the Tucson's boot is the same size as the petrol models. However, the mild hybrid versions boot is 43 litres smaller. They might be wondering, what the heck is that? Well, it's because the battery pack for the hybrid is actually underneath the car, whereas for the mild hybrid, the larger battery is underneath the boot floor. Hence, slight less boot space. When you use Android Auto, you don't use the whole screen. Look, you only get this small area, which is actually mappage, and the rest is a big old waste of space. The eyes are fixed anchor points on the rear seat are buried between the seat back and the seat base. And so they're quite hard to get out. It takes a bit of stabbing to get it located. There's only one standard color which comes for free with the car, and it's red. Red is the only standard color. It's a bit polarizing, isn't it? It's not all negative though. Here's five good things about this car. You know how a lot of cars have hands-free target opening, where you have to wave your foot underneath the rear bumper to get it to open and often and it doesn't quite work and it's a bit of a faff. With this car, you just have to stand near the boot like that for three seconds. Ta-da! Swipe Well, the automatic version of the normal Tucson has one of those traditional gear selector levers. The hybrid has this little pod here with buttons that you press for drive, neutral or reverse because it's gear selection by wire. The car gets a central airbag. That means that if you're in an accident and there's a passenger sat there, you don't end up clattering into each other. Ow. The load cover. It's nice and light. And look, it fits neatly underneath the boot floor. There's a special feature which allows you to cut off the audio 
from any phone call or from your music player from the back seats. It's called a slumber mode and it just allows people in the back to relax and have a proper nap. Now if you'll excuse me. Right, before we go driving, let's talk about the engine choices. And it's kind of very simple. There is only one engine, right? But you can get in different combinations. So it's a 1.6 litre turbo petrol. Oh, that's a heavy bonnet. You can get it just with that petrol engine. 150 horsepower, it's front wheel drive, manual gearbox. Then there's a mild hybrid version, which has a little electric motor, which doubles as your starter motor, which can give you a little bit of a boost to help improve economy. That has 150 horsepower again, but you can have it as a manual or an automatic. You can also get that system, but with a bit more power, with 180 horsepower, and then it comes with all wheel drive. Well, there's this version, it's the hybrid. You can tell by the fact it's got the orange cables, high voltage cables. So that has the same 1.6 litre turbo petrol, but an electric motor to boost the output. It's automatic, obviously. But which combination of engine and trim should you get this Hyundai Tucson in? Well, I've actually configured my favourite version of this car. And if you click on the pop-out banner up there, you can see the offer I've got back from one of our trusted dealers and which trim and engine combination I prefer. Okay then, let's see what this Hyundai Tucson is like to drive, starting off with in town. Well, this raised driving position is great for forward visibility. There's a bit of a blind spot from here. It's not too bad, but you have got big side mirrors. The view out the back window is all right as well. So it's fairly confidence inspiring when you're maneuvering around town. You really get a sense of where the corners are, which helps when parking as well. One thing I have noticed though, is that the suspension feels a little bit firmer than I'd like in a car such as this. I do think that other cars like a Skoda Karak, for instance, is just a bit more comfortable over bumps. If you click on the pop-out banner up there, you can watch my in-depth video review of that car. One thing that is good about this particular Tucson in town is the fact that it's a hybrid, so you can just mooch along on electric power alone for very short distances. You can't go that far because it's not a plug-in hybrid, but it does mean that it's quite relaxed when you're just pootling around. I like that about it. What's less relaxing though, are the brakes. They're strong, but because when you're braking you recoup energy, put it back into the battery, they can feel a little bit jerky and a touch hard to judge. The turning circle on the car is, well, we'll see now, I'm going around a mini roundabout is adequate. <laughs> I did have to mount the mini roundabout. I hope it wasn't offended by being mounted. It seemed fine. I'll tell you what also seems fine, the gearbox. It's generally pretty good if you're just cruising along. However, when you put your foot down all of a sudden, it can sometimes take a wee while to respond when the electric motor works together with the petrol engine and the gearbox to give you that forward propulsion. It's not terrible, it's just not the sharpest system. This car has the fully automated cruise controls. Set it going and it'll steer to keep you in lane. And you can actually use it at town speeds. Look, I'm in a 30 and it's actually doing its thing. Cruise control at 30 mile an hour. Why the heck not? Of course, you've got all the safety systems as well. So if you get too close to a car in front, it will automatically brake and save your skin if you're not paying attention. And beep at you constantly like that. Annoying, but safely annoying. Finally then, let's see what this Tucson is like on a twisty road. Well, the first thing I notice is that the steering feels overly light now, and it's not as if it's connected to the front wheels. It doesn't give you that much confidence to go quickly. Not that you really want to go that quickly in a car like this, but should you want to, nah. <laughs> doesn't encourage spirited driving. Now you can put it into sports mode and it weights up the steering and makes the car feel a little bit more lively, but really sports mode in this car is largely pointless. It doesn't quite go down the road as well as something like a set Ateca. I put a, oh, oh, that's a lane departure warning. Anyway, <laughs> I put a link to my review of the set Ateca just up there. If you click on that, you can watch my video of that car. I'll tell you what else I've noticed about this thing is that when you're going quicker, you do get a little bit more wind noise than you would doing something like a Volvo XC40. It's not bad though. When you're on the motorway and you hit these undulations, it's actually quite good at dealing with them. It feels fairly solid. So the suspension does get better with speed. I'm gonna come out of sports mode now because it is ridiculous. Back into eco. Speaking of which, oh, not a lane departure warning again. Speaking of which, <laughs> I'm averaging around 37 miles per gallon, which is all right in a big car like this. It's not brilliant, it's all right. So then, what's my final verdict on the new Hyundai Tucson? Should you 
avoid it? Should you consider it? Should you shortlist it? Or should you just go right ahead and buy it? Well, I reckon you should consider the Tucson. It's a decent enough family car. It just doesn't really do anything particularly unique. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a like. Also, comment below of any kind of other videos you'd like us to do. If you want to watch some more videos, click on the windows there. And if you click on the box, you can download the CarWow app. It's completely free. You can use it to like browse all our reviews and see how much money we can save you on a new car. On average, we can save £3,600. That's right. Also, it has a special number plate reader, so you can scan any car's number plate and it'll tell you how much that car is currently worth. Download it. It's completely free.